Well, we're in a series called Purposeful. We're actually in part three. And today we're talking about disagreeing well. Let me ask you, when was the last time that you lost some sleep? You know, when was the last time that you just were woken in the middle of the night and you couldn't quite fall back asleep? And do you remember what the issue was about? Chances are it was relational. Most of the time it has to do with something relational in our lives. And what's interesting is how we navigate um, disagreement or conflict how we navigate or um, go about conflict or disagreement will either make or break us in living a purpose-filled life. And here's the reason why, and you've experienced it over COVID. For some, you realize how you've navigated or handled or even mishandled conflict or disagreement made or broke that friendship, didn't it? Or made or broke that relationship with that family member or with your kids. And if we're going to be a church that lives purpose-filled, we have to learn how to navigate conflict or disagreement really, really well. In fact, God has a design for how we are to do that. The world has a design for it as well. And the world's design is simply this right now. It's uh, if you disagree with me, basically you are no good to me, right? If you disagree with me, you're just no good to me and I'm going to cut you off. That is not God's way for handling disagreement, or conflict. And so we want to wrestle with this question today. How do you navigate disagreement as a follower of Jesus? How do you navigate disagreement or conflict productively, healthily, in a way that honors Jesus? And I want to talk about really three just observations about conflict and give you a few steps in how to navigate it well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to dive into one of the most famous disagreements in the New Testament. It's one in which almost you don't expect it, but then when you get below the surface, you go like, oh, that makes complete Sense. It's a disagreement that Paul and Barnabas had that caused them to part ways in their ministry journey together. If you got your Bibles, would you open up to Acts chapter 15, verse 36? Uh, we pick up the story here. It says, some time later, well, what's some time later? Well, last week we just talked about the Jerusalem Council and this incredible good news of, of what does it mean for us as followers of Jesus and stepping in, it's by faith alone and we don't have to become Jewish to follow Jesus. We just have to have faith in him. So sometime later after that, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word, the Lord, the word of the Lord, and see how they're doing. Great idea, right? Listen, we, we haven't seen them in a while. We planted these churches. We love them, and we want to see how they're doing. And it was like, well, that's a fantastic idea. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. Now, John Mark, if you remember, uh, he, his mom was uh, the one who hosted uh, all the way back when in Jerusalem a prayer vigil for Peter uh, when he was in jail and they prayed all night and Peter was released. His, his home was most likely the home of the upper room you know, discourse and last supper during Jesus' day. So his family's super connected, but even more connected is John Mark is Barnabas's cousin. And he joined them in their first journey together, but as you'll see, he didn't finish the journey. Uh, but Paul did not think it wise to take him. Why? Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. And so Barnabas says, listen, my name is Son of Encouragement. That's literally my name. And I've come around guys that need a second chance. And Paul, you're one of them. And John Mark's one of them. He deserted us. Let's bring him along. I know he's got it in us. And Paul's going, listen, where we're headed is going to get rough. We need people really dedicated. Uh, we need someone who's not going to 
flinch in the face of danger, and, and he hasn't proven himself there. I don't think it's wise as we're gonna take him into that land for him to repeat the same mistake. Now, notice what happens. They had such a sharp disagreement. These are two incredibly godly men. They had such a sharp disagreement, what happens? That they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas, a, a, a notable leader in the church in Jerusalem and then in Antioch, and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia and strengthened the churches. These two incredible powerhouses have in a, just a huge disagreement. And I want you to notice a couple things about their disagreement is their disagreement uh, actually expanded their impact. It didn't diminish their impact. So when we're gonna talk about navigating disagreement well, they weren't able to continue working together, but they were continuing the work of the ministry. And you'll notice here on this um, this map, so Barnabas, his hometown actually is Cyprus. He takes John Mark and he heads through Cyprus. And John Mark had been through Cyprus already before. That's where he started out on the missionary journey. And so then Paul takes uh, Silas with him and he heads up through here. Tarsus, his hometown's up here and goes into Asia Minor, the Galatia area, and then continues on through this area preaching the gospel. And so that the way they disagreed, though it was sharp, and they said, hey, you know what? Our season has ended. It didn't end their ministry. It didn't end their future ministry relationship and partnership together. It's something so incredible is later on, the apostle uh, Peter, or Paul rather, would say uh, to Timothy, send um, John Mark with me, to me, for he is useful to me. And he always spoke well and highly of Barnabas as well. You know, out of this, there's actually just a few observations about conflict uh, that we just need to talk about before we talk about navigating conflict well. First observation is just simply this, that conflict's unavoidable. Listen, if Paul and Barnabas can get into a sharp dispute, you or I can. We all can. I mean, Barnabas literally named son of encouragement. Paul wrote almost half of the New Testament, incredibly good, godly people. No matter how good or godly you are, you will experience conflict. It's unavoidable. It's going to happen. It's not whether you're going to experience it. It's how you navigate it that it is important. The second thing is just simply, let's just talk about the obvious. Conflict's difficult, isn't it? It was difficult here. It was difficult for them. I, I, it's difficult for others around it. I think it's difficult for us because uh, when we're talking about conflict or disagreement, it, it's emotional, isn't it? And the first emotion that we feel is often anger. And anger begins to fuel, or one person said anger is like the... Um, uh, the alcoholic um, emotion, you know, the more you drink of it, the more it fuels you or consumes you. Um, and, and the other thing is our natural responses or maybe the way we grew up and taught us. Some of us are just avoiders. We'll avoid at all costs or some of us are attackers. Our natural responses don't help us navigate this well or even uh, our perspective. You know, Jeremiah the prophet would say the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else. Like we have a huge propensity to be self-deceived. I, I, it's incredible to me that I need to recognize and have the humility to say, I don't see things as clearly as I think I do. We don't often see things as clearly as we think we do, and as a result, it makes conflict incredibly difficult. So it's unavoidable, it's difficult, but here's what's good, uh, good news. Conflict is an opportunity to grow. Proverbs 27, 17, we talked about it last week. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. It's an opportunity to grow. That iron sharpening iron is that friction, it's the rubbing against that, that helps us become who God made us to be, to shave off the rough edges in our life. And I just think about this. Like so often when we think about Paul and Barnabas and you read this, well, who was wrong in this? 
And neither. In fact, both were living out and following their calling. Barnabas was called to come alongside and be an encourager and help those he saw potential in. Paul was called to be an entrepreneurial leader to step out and, and plant new churches. And in both of those, they finally came to a point where they realized Barnabas' calling and Paul's calling weren't at, able to work together at the same time. And so Barnabas took John Mark which I'm so glad he did. By the way, John Mark later penned the Gospel of Mark. Incredibly useful. And Paul, Paul went on and took Silas, and I'm so glad he did. He later penned all these letters in the churches that he planted. You see, it's an incredible opportunity to grow if, if we'll take the time to navigate disagreement and conflict well. So how do you navigate conflict so it's an opportunity to grow? I just want to talk about really four uh, things to help us navigate conflict or disagreements well. The very first thing here is you need to define the problem on your own. Navigating disagreements well, you have to define the problem on your own. This is incredibly hard today, not with your besties. Define the problem on your own, um, not with your small group even. Define the problem on your own. See, our natural is the minute there's a disagreement, the minute there's something that happens or something, we want to begin to tell everyone else why we're right and they're wrong. Or we just want someone to agree with our perspective, right? Sometimes, don't you just share things? I do this to Jenny all the time. Like, I'll share something, expecting her to go like, yeah, come on, I can't believe that. But you know what she does? Oh, she's so wise, she's so good. She's like, yeah, you know, maybe you're not seeing the whole picture. I'm like, come on, no, just agree with me. See, the calling to navigate, uh, you know, disagreement, well, as we first have to define the problem, what is the issue, what's really going on, and we have to take time on our own. How do we do that? First, examine your heart and your part. Matthew 7, uh, 3 through 5 says, it, it, Jesus is talking about this, and he says, how dare you try to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye when you have a plank in your own eye? Uh, like, Examine your heart. Take time to examine your heart and go, you know, we so often focus on the other person, what they did, what they're doing. God, would you show me anything in me that's not of you? Would you show me my part that I've played? God, would you give me a sensitive and a tender heart? Would you give me a humble heart that you would take time first and examine your heart and your part? I'd encourage you deeply, if you're, even if you're not a journaler, take time and write it out. Take time and write it out and write down what are the facts, not what you feel. Our feelings drive so much, but what actually happened and what are the facts? Then move from thinking about that person to praying for them. Move from thinking about that person to praying for them. Jesus would say that we're to pray for those who persecute us and we're to bless our enemies. This is profound if you want to navigate conflict or disagreements well. Every time you think about that person, instead of going down the spin cycle of all the things that they did wrong or we obsess about this and what we'll say next time we see them or if we could just put them in their place, I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to pray for them. Prayer is powerful and effective. It changes us. It changes them. It changes the atmosphere. It prepares the way. Okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to define the problem on our own, examine your heart and part, and move from thinking about them to praying about them, and then we're going to choose, we're going to choose something for them. Here's what we're going to choose. We're going to choose to give a generous explanation for their behavior. We naturally go to the worst explanation. You've been around, you've heard me ask this question, what's the most generous explanation for their behavior? Here's why. We're gonna give them the benefit of the doubt that we would want them to give us. 
we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt that we would want them to give us. When we do not do this, then we begin to have a, it's almost like a filter upon which we see everything that they do. It colors and it shades all that they do because we read it through the worst possible explanation and we assign motives and we assign judgment and value and all of those things to them. And so we're going to give the most generous explanation for their behavior and if necessary, seek wise counsel. Why do I say if necessary? Because there's so many things where God's incredibly clear You don't need wise counsel, you need God's word. And often we use wise counsel not so much as a way to get wise counsel, but as a way to gripe, as a way to complain, as a way to criticize, and we never move forward or take action moving forward. If necessary, there may be something that you do need wise counsel. And so it's not tell people to get them on your side. It's not, you know, post something cryptic on social media and say, would you please help me or please pray for me? It's not, you know, like bringing it before your small group or your group of friends and just saying, I really need your prayer on this and this is the issue and I can't believe you did this. You can ask your small group, hey, you know what? I have a really tough conversation coming up. I'm praying that God will give me wisdom. Would you pray with me? And would the and coming to this point number two, and would you hold me accountable to have the conversation? Because I need that. Because these things are hard, aren't they? They're difficult, and I don't want to do it. And I, you know, I left to myself. I'll kind of cop out. So first, navigating disagreements well. Define the problem on your own. Second, set up a time to talk. Don't put it off. Set up a time to talk to the person. Do not put it off. Go directly to the person. Such harm, and I've talked about this a little bit already, such harm is done when we do sideways conversations and we talk around people but not talk to people. That's called gossip. God's word speaks a ton about that and the harm and devastation in relationships. Go to the person directly. Set up a time to talk. And and here's, let let me just kind of give you maybe some language of how to set up a time to talk. Because say something like this, you know, I've got something bothering me. I may be misunderstanding something or the situation, when you have an opportunity, I'd like to talk with you about it. Because I know that starting the conversation can be hard and, and you can maybe have a text or a phone call, something along those lines, but we don't have this conversation uh, over text or over email uh, or over any instant message. But you can write them and say this, I've got something bothering me. I may uh, be misunderstanding something or the situation opening up that you don't see the entire thing. You don't understand everything. When you have an opportunity, I'd like to talk with you about this. So set up a time to talk. Don't put it off. Here's how we're going to do it. First and foremost, we're going to do it face to face. Face to face. Worst case, do it via Zoom. But so much is lost in Zoom. Never have an important or hard conversation via email. It's just like dropping the mic and walking away. Here's why. 7% of communication is our words. 7% of it. Uh, Another 38% of communication is our tone. 55% of our communication that is received by the person hearing it is our body language or nonverbal. And so when we only do, you know, a, an email, we allow the other person to read the voice in the tone and we miss out on 93% of the communication. We're going to do this face to face. We're going to go directly to the person. In fact, Matthew 5, Jesus would say there, if you're at the temple presenting your offering and you realize that your brother has something against you, and we talked about this uh, last week, if somebody has something against you, not that you have something against them, but if you realize they have something against you, leave your gift at the offering uh, at the temple and go and be reconciled to them. 
It's such a big deal to Jesus that you would skip worship, you'd skip church to be reconciled, to, to resolve this with your friend, with your neighbor, with your family member, to take this step and go meet face to face. And then we'll do it sooner rather than later. Do it sooner than later, sooner than later. Why? Because we want to procrastinate. Why? Because we're going to just... Uh, you know, allow something to fester and eventually it will just stay below the surface until something else happens. Uh, the Apostle Paul would say this, be angry, in Ephesians chapter four, yet do not sin. Be angry, you can be angry. In fact, it's not don't be angry, it's be angry. In fact, really incredible. It's, say out loud, maybe this is where you're at. I am angry, period. Now, what am I gonna do about it? Be angry and do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger, meaning that if you allow it to fester and to build, here's what the scripture says, and do not give the devil a foothold, that then the root of bitterness that then begins to divide families, that then begins to divide uh, friends, that then begin to divide churches, gets in there and the enemy has a heyday. And so we're going to do it sooner rather than later. Would you set up a time to talk? Don't put it off. Have a conversation rather than what our culture does is we just, we're holding uh, contempt. We're holding on to, here's what contempt means. Contempt is the feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration, worthless, or deserving scorn. When you do not have the conversation, what you're saying and holding on to contempt is that they're beneath consideration, worthless, deserving of scorn. And every single person is an image bearer of the God most high, deserving at minimum the conversation. To find the problem, set up a time to talk. Uh, step three, address the problem, don't attack the person. Address the problem. We're, we we got to talk about this, but don't attack the person. Well, what does that look like? Be specific. Focus on one issue, not many issues. Be specific, not vague. Here's what we do. You always, every time, people say this, somehow to bolster our argument, we try to bring in other people, don't we? You, you ever do that? You try to go like, well, you know, people say, or, you know, people did this. And it's like, people, who are people? Be specific. When you did this, it really hurt my feelings. Or I don't fully understand what you were saying here. Could you help me understand? But be specific, focus on one thing, not many things. Don't try to accomplish, I, I, you know, it's kind of the person who keeps a running list with people and all of a sudden I got time to talk and I got 15 things, I'm just gonna boom, 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 hit you and the person's like, I can't, how can we even move forward on that? Deal with one thing at a time. We're gonna address the problem, we're not gonna attack the person. Here's uh, another way we do it. Our language matters. Speak the truth in love. Again, in Ephesians chapter four, Jesus, uh, the apostle Paul says, speaking the truth in love will grow up into maturity. It's part of how we mature. Part of how we live out who we are is that we're gonna speak the truth in love. See, if we're all truth, we're just harsh and people can't hear it. If we're all love, we just hide and we'll never really get around to it. it Truth speakers who bring gentleness and love, they're healers. And so our tone and our posture and our heart behind what we say matters. That the aim and the goal isn't so I can be right or I can put you in your place or somehow to make you feel it's, man, how can we be restored? How can we have reconciliation? And I'm gonna speak the truth in love because I want your very best for you. And finally, seek a resolution and extend forgiveness. A resolution, look to set things right. Maybe you need a specific plan. Listen, there's some things where... Uh, 
some people have maybe you're as a married couple and there's a reoccurring issue that keeps coming up, have a specific plan. Okay, we're, we're going to plan out, you know, uh, this is what I'm going to do. You know, for, for me, I'm going to start, um, every time I come home, I'm going to acknowledge and say hello and how are you because I re- recognize that when I'm in my head, it hurts your feelings. But what is it? Just come up with a specific plan and then extend forgiveness. Learn how to give forgiveness and learn how to ask for forgiveness. Asking for forgiveness is, is a lost art. It's saying, I was wrong. And we don't want to say that today. I was wrong. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. And he gets specific, I'm sorry for this. Would you please forgive me? But extend forgiveness, and forgiveness literally means to let go of your right for revenge. That's all it means. It means I'm not going to hold this over you. And here's what we can't do as followers of Jesus. We can't say this. I can never forgive them. And here's why. God says, in the same way that I've forgiven you, we are then to forgive others. In the same way that Jesus has said, everything you've ever done is completely wiped away and I forgive you and welcome you in. He says, that's the way we're to treat and to forgive others. And so we're gonna address the problem and we're not gonna attack the person. And finally, if we get stuck, we're gonna seek outside help. Matthew 18 explains the process for how do we go about things. In Matthew 18, jot it down, it's in your notes, 15 through 17 says, first go to your brother or sister one-on-one. We just talked about that. If you get stuck there, bring one or two witnesses, one or two people that can you know, either have seen exactly what's going on or be able to speak into that and really work together to find a resolution, to, to be able to move forward. Uh, if that doesn't work, then it says bring it to the leadership of the church. And if you get stuck, if necessary, get outside help. And for many, I would say, for those with relationships where you go, man, this is, maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's um, a close friendship. Maybe you realize I don't handle disagreement well and I've been dealing with this with other people or I've been actually, Ryan, I've actually been that poster or I've been the critical one. Getting outside help might mean getting a counselor or a therapist. You know, one of the best decisions for Jenny and I, it was, um, it's probably close to eight years now, uh, it's at least seven years ago, Um, We were in a place in our marriage where it just was so hard. And it just felt like we just kept hitting uh, up against one another. And um, we'd been married, you know, maybe seven years or so. And it just, I I was getting to that place where, man, I don't know how we're going to make it. And I was going through a, a program called Soul Care. Uh, and it's this incredible thing for uh, pastors and leaders to help you really grow in your own you know, personal walk and deep soul relationship. And through that time of just having time to actually be silent and still, which I didn't like, I was like, I like to do stuff, and having to really journal, I finally came to the place where I realized well, we need counseling. And it's the best decision and it's the best money we've ever spent on our marriage. See, my wife was fine with counseling. It was me, I was too prideful. And so often that's what keeps us from really navigating uh, conflict or disagreements well. It's our own pride. And we started counseling and we've been seeing Sue for years. We still see her to this day once a month. Every Wednesday we spend time and we're constantly developing, growing. If you get stuck, seek outside help. It's okay. All of us are going to get stuck from time to time and we're going to have things like this. It's just not okay. Don't stay stuck. You don't have to. And so navigating uh, conflict well. Define the problem on your own. Set up a time to talk. Don't put it off. Address the problem. Don't attack the person. And if stuck, seek outside help. Why? Why? Because how you navigate, how I navigate, 
disagreements will make or break a purpose-filled life. And listen so much, uh, listen up here, how we navigate as a church. Disagreements and conflict will make or break our effectiveness as a church. In fact, Jesus knew this was such a big deal and that we would struggle with it. Think about this. He prayed for you and me. On the night he was betrayed, John chapter 17, he prayed for you and me. He said, I pray for those who will believe in me. In the word and the testimony of my disciples. I pray, like he's praying for us. And what was his prayer? I pray that they will be one even as the Father and I are one. Because he knew. Left to our own devices, we could fragment and fray. And that's my prayer for us as we close our time. Heavenly Father, God, would you make us one? Would you unite us just as you, uh, Heavenly Father, and the Son are one? God, God, would you take the little things or issues that are dividing uh, friends or dividing family or dividing, uh, you know, um, roommates, God, would, would, you, would you give us the courage to say, no, we want to we navigate this well. We want to love others well. We want to be your church and, and bring about a unity of heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen.